library system, which is a pretty good library system in its own right. And I miss the Bay Area. Um, I was fortunate that San Mateo County, they contacted me about coming back in late 2011. And so I did return in early 2012 as a deputy director. And I was there for a couple of years and I was headhunted to come to San Francisco and serve as deputy city librarian for Luis Herrera. And wow, what an experience. I never thought in a million years I had a shot in hell of getting that job. But um, I just wanted to go through the process and shake Luis's hand and be on my way. But the deeper I got in the process, the more I wanted the job. And fortunately, he picked me. And I got to work for one of the best in the business for four years and just basically receive an Ivy League education in library leadership. And uh, when he hung it up in 2018, I served as acting city librarian for a year and then got the nod from Mayor London Breed. Wow, that, that's amazing. Okay, a couple questions I, I have about what you were saying. First one, didn't realize like you did the um, like story times. That's cool, so like what was your go-to story time? If you had to do a story time today, what would be the book or theme that you would uh, pick out and do? Well, um, I love The Missing Piece by Shel Silverstein. So that's one of my go-tos. There's a story, King Louis Cats. It's by Dr. Seuss. It's in a book, I Can Lick 30 Tigers Today. Um, I like Yo Yes, Chris, Chris Roshka. Uh, I've got a bunch of finger plays, uh, you know, the elephant song. I've, I've got a whole repertoire. I love being a children's librarian. <laughs> and occasionally I, I get to do a story time here and there. I, I recently did a virtual story time, which was a lot of fun. Oh, nice. Okay, and then if you weren't a librarian, what do you think you'd be doing now? That's a good question. I started out as a business major and I switched to history because I thought I wanted to teach high school and coach high school athletics. Um, and then when I graduated from college, I still looked like I was 12 years old and I wasn't ready to go into a classroom. Um, so I, I, was, I continued working at the library. They had a full-time job waiting for me. Um, and then for a while, I was thinking, I'm either going to go to grad school and become a librarian, or I'm going to go in the Air Force. And uh, I ended up going to library school. So, I mean, you didn't grow up thinking, ah, one day I'm going to be a librarian. No, not at all. I was more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mowed people's lawns. I painted houses. I did a lot of things to earn money growing up. I mean, my family was not rich. And so we were very blue collar. And, um, you know, I got my work ethic from my grandmother that raised me. And, uh, you know, just I did a lot of odd jobs, dishwasher, I worked in a sandwich shop. Um, I'm actually incorporated in South Carolina. I started a company briefly called Lambert's Lighting, and it didn't take off. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I had the library there throughout. It was always my safety net. Hmm. Yeah, another question, how old were you when you came over from um, South Korea? I was eight months old. Oh, yeah. okay. Hmm. Yeah. All right, right now we're gonna have a little fun with uh, Michael Lambert. And I think we call this segment, one picture re might require a thousand words. And <laughs> did a little bit of uh, snooping around and, <laughs> on Michael's uh, internet. Well, only his uh, Facebook, since that's the only social media I have. And uh, <laughs> found a few interesting pictures that I, I think require a little bit further uh, explanation here. So let's start with this one here. Is this, what, City Lights Bookstore? Actually, that's this really cool, funky bookstore in Palo Alto. That's where I live. And I was out on a date with my girlfriend and we had to pop into this bookstore. Um, I, you know, I'm a librarian and I just drug her in there and was like, we got to check this out. And I ended up buying a copy of The Missing Piece that evening for her nephew. And uh, it was a great experience. It was, it was a really cool bookstore. 
And I think if, if you look real closely at this little sign right behind you here, it says, uh, no dancing or posing on the, uh, the stairs. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Next question. I mean, you mentioned this earlier, and uh, your son, James. Yes. Tell, tell us a little bit about him. Uh, that's my pride and joy. That is my purpose in life. Uh, I love that kid more than life itself, and I'm just so proud of him. He's 16. He's a sophomore at Gunn High School. He's an incredible young man. He's just so compassionate and... Um, makes good grades. He's the star quarterback of the football team. And he's just a really good kid. And it looks like he might be like wearing one of your suits now too. Huh? He Same is. Size. Yeah, <laughs> much better than I do. <laughs> hey, he's got style too. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> All right, what's going on here? So this was about six weeks ago at the start of the pandemic. Um, at the time, I was trying to partner with uh, the Recreation and Parks Department and the Department of Children, Youth and Families. The San Francisco Public Library was attempting to stand up emergency childcare in our facilities for healthcare workers. And we got it off the ground for one day and um, we ended up pausing and some other community-based organizations came online to serve the segment of the population that we were going to serve, which was high school students. But this particular day, uh, my chief of community programs and partnerships, Michelle Jeffers and I, we were delivering food to some of the recreation and park sites because, um, you know, since the schools closed, so many of those youth, they depended on school for getting three square meals a day. So, City and County of San Francisco, they've been very intentional about uh, making sure people are still getting food. And, um, you know, they recently started activating hotels as well to house the unhoused and make sure people are getting shelter and food. So it's, uh, it was fun, you know, it was, it's an honor to serve the city and county of San Francisco. Wow. And yeah, it's definitely other job duties as assigned here. That's great. So. All right, what's going on here? Wow. Oh, <laughs> that looks like an X-Men um, Dark Phoenix poster at the movie theater. So I'm a huge X-Men fan. It, it actually might have been an early clue that I was going to be a librarian because I collected comic books and they were meticulously organized and I had them merchandised in my room. And um, But yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the new mutants that was supposed to come out April 4th. Um, so hopefully it'll show up soon on Apple TV or something. But yeah, that was a, a date night. And uh, do you still have those comic books by any chance? I wish I did, but I have been able to relive my childhood. And for a, a while, my son was collecting comic books. So I recreated my comic book collection through him. Hmm. All right, what we got next? Oh, here's the infamous uh, skateboarding picture. <laughs> has not been Photoshopped, apparently. So tell us about this. Well, that's called an invert. It's a skateboarding maneuver where you propel yourself upside down. And, um, you know, typically this is a street plant actually. So, you know, you can do this on a ramp, you can do this in a pool or you can do it on the street. So this was just goofing around, having some fun on Thanksgiving after I ate a big meal. <laughs> And uh, so what happens after this? I mean, if I were doing this, I probably would have just fallen on my face, but you like twist around and get back on the skateboard again and keep going? Yeah, exactly. So you fall down basically with your feet on the board and you stand up and roll away. <laughs> wow. All right, if you say so. And how much did, when you were a kid then you skated a lot? Skateboarding was my first love. It was my passion. I skateboarded competitively, uh, briefly, but I skateboarded probably from the time I was in the fifth grade, I'd say, 
till today. And um, I still, you know, mess around a little bit. Um, mm. But yeah, I love skateboarding. I, I actually traveled to California for the first time between my eighth grade and ninth grade year. And this was like a, you know, country boy from South Carolina. I came out here to San Francisco just to skateboard. So it's kind of ironic that I'm here now as the city librarian running people off of the main library grounds. <laughs> <It's karma. laughs> yeah, right. I just thought this was a good picture because <laughs> it looks like the arrow is gonna. I think the caption when I saw this was like your keep your toupee is gonna <laughs> exactly <laughs> edit towards well, the day. It was very windy. That's my beautiful girlfriend, Christine, and we were just enjoying a lovely day in the city that day. Hmm. I mean, and I got to ask you too. Where are you getting your hair done now? Because I mean, my my hair is a mess, but like usual, your hair looks like it's perfect. Well. I don't know if you can tell, but it's it's growing out. I'm uh, hmm. just going with it. I'm gonna have a Korean afro by the time this is all over with. <laughs> all right, and this is the last picture. And go ahead. My man, Louis. His nickname's Guapo, which means handsome, and uh, I'm Guapito. That's Guapo, and uh, yeah, that's my mentor. You know, there's a saying you know, your friends or your family that you get to choose. And I love this man. He's, he's family to me. He's done so much for me and my family and my career. And I just will be forever grateful to him. Um, you know, I've, I've learned from the best, you know, spending the last four years of his career uh, as his deputy, I could not have asked for a better opportunity. Okay, and I, I, I turned the screen off, but I wanted to ask people out in library land too, if you can put in, in the chat box, like who has been your professional, whether it's a role model or a mentor, because I know I'd be real curious to, to learn more about you people and the role of a mentor. I mean, and Michael, just talk a little bit more about why you think one, having a mentor was important, but now two, as I think it's, you know, you're starting to give back to as far as your responsibilities now as being a role model, because I'm going to assume you are a role model to a lot of people. I try. I really do. Um, you know, there's so many cliches, heavy is the head that wears the crown, leadership is a lonely place. And there's some elements of truth in, in those phrases. And, you know, having a mentor, having a special relationship with another library professional, uh, particularly a library leader, uh, someone like Luis or you know you, Robert, um, it, it's really forming a partnership, and you know having a partner is so critical um, because we all need support, even library directors. Um, it's important that, you know, we have somebody that we can pick up the phone or deputy directors or senior managers, branch managers, every level of, uh, librarians, we all need support and colleagues that we can turn to for advice, you know, just to bounce, bounce ideas off of, to vent. Um, so it, it's critical that people build strong relationships in this profession because, Another cliche, we truly are all in this together <laughs> and libraries are an ecosystem and it's, it's so critical that we all look out for one another because we're all so interconnected in how successful we're going to be as an industry. Yeah, well, I'm seeing some of the, the names that are, are uh, popping in here right now. Eileen Browning, Don Jackson, oh this must be a Santa Maria. A bunch of people at LAPL, you know, Patty Wong, Tracy, Camilla O'Leary, Je Jessica Jupitus, she's in Sacramento, right, okay. Georgette Gong, that's great. I, I mean, I, I think it's really important that, you know, you acknowledge these people too that are 
helping you as you move up and then just know that one day, yeah, it's going to be your turn to, to give, start giving back as well. I, I know a lot of people in the audience, so you're already giving back. So I, I think it's great. Um, can you share maybe one thing that Luis told you as far as once he, you were anointed the new city librarian, what was maybe the first piece of advice that he gave to you? Um, you know, it was a journey because when he hung it up in February of 2018, um, none of us really saw it coming because he had so much left in the tank. I mean, Luis was like Michael Jordan. He went out at the top of his game. And uh, so at the time, I didn't think I was going to buy for his position. I was referring to myself as the caretaker librarian. <laughs> and, you know, a funny thing happened. Um, you never know what you're capable of doing until you have to do it. And I give all the credit in the world to my team and my girlfriend. They, they all rallied around me and encouraged me and supported me. And I, I started really believing in myself and, and seeing that I could do it and I could do it well. And, you know, the recruitment uh, took a long time. I, I served as acting city librarian for a year. So by the time I had to really buy for the position, I was supremely confident in my ability to do it. But, you know, as far as um, advice, Luis didn't pressure me. He was, you know, being very supportive and he was honoring what um, I was saying that I wanted to do at the time. But, you know, I've talked to him recently and uh, you know, at the outbreak of this pandemic. And we had a really strong conversation about staying true to our values as people and maintaining our integrity during difficult times. And, you know, it, it just, it really reaffirmed, you know, my beliefs about leadership and, you know, serving um, our community because leadership is so critical in a crisis. And, you know, this is when we as managers and directors and library administrators really have to earn our keep. And so it, it was a really good pep talk that I had with him recently. Hmm. I, I'm going to get back to the, I think, just more about your perspective on leadership in crisis. But th there was a question that came up in, in the Q&A. I think it, it, it's a good question about how do you find a mentor if maybe you don't, you know, you're new in your career, for example, or, uh, you know, just any advice for doing something like that if you're not maybe set in a library system yet? You know, I would say begin with people that you have some level of a relationship with already. You don't want to just cold call people. Um, so I, I think we all have people in our network or our immediate orbit. And um, I, I think, you know, contacting one of those individuals and you probably have some level of intuition about whether they would be a good mentor and maybe whether they would be willing to devote some time. Um, you know, and it, it also doesn't have to necessarily be somebody in the library profession. Um, you know, I have a lifelong friend who's a couple years older than me, and he's always been a mentor for me. I've, I've looked up to him ever since I was in elementary school, and I still, you know, go to him for advice. So I think, you know, you can be creative in how you think about mentors and people that can support you, who want to support you. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. And I, I mean, I've always found, too, that People are flattered if you actually want them to kind of be a role model or a mentor or something like that. I think it's important maybe early on to set up some ground rules as far as, you know, what, you know, what the relationship might actually look like or if you're formally going to try to get together, you know, once a month or, and the, I think the other thing is mentors as you 
go through your career, they're going to change because someone who may help you now when you're an entry level librarian, you know, it could be a little bit different five years from now when you're, you know, a branch manager, you're starting to, you know, look at being a, a library director. So, uh, you know, I, I think it, it should change. It should not be necessarily the same person either, but I, I do think it's important to, to find mentors and there's some great ones out there. So. Hey, on that note, Robert, one other thing I would recommend to people, um, particularly new library administrators or, you know, anybody that is making that leap from middle management uh, to senior management or library administration, really consider getting an executive coach. And, you know, it's not cheap, but it's well worth the investment. You can shop around. Um, you know, I, I had the benefit of uh, a library director in San Mateo County who invested in me. And, you know, I was rough around the edges when I made that leap from middle management to become a deputy director. And um, Anne-Marie Despain, she supported me. And I, I think the impact on me was transformational. It, it gave me a greater sense of self-awareness uh, that's interesting. I mean, what, what kind of rough edges did you have? Because I mean, maybe well, I knew you as a finished product and not. No, I, I think um, knowing thyself is so critically important if you're going to be leading large groups of people. And I think I didn't have sufficient self-awareness <laughs> to be a strong library administrator uh, when I embarked on that that new role. So thank you, Anne Marie, for helping me through that. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about your advice for leading in crisis. I mean, you, you kind of touched on it, but let's go into maybe a little bit more detail about just maybe observations you've had and advice that you're giving to people right now and how you're trying to, to lead at this particular time. Well, I think it's so important to lead by example and, you know, today I'm going to be deploying myself as a disaster service worker at 3 p.m. Uh, and I'll be working from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. at a hotel in San Francisco that's housing and sheltering people that either have the coronavirus or are recovering from the coronavirus. and. You know, these are individuals who are unhoused and um, I'm part of the city and county of San Francisco's mobilization of city workers to make sure these people are safe and that they have access to food. Um, so that's first and foremost, never ask somebody on your team to do something that you're not willing to do mm -hmm. yourself. Um, I think, you know, being positive and you know, taking care of yourself. So you have to stay healthy yourself. You have to work out, you have to eat right. You have to get good sleep. It sounds basic, but it's been so critical uh, to my success is getting in a good routine. And you now I exercise every day and that helps you deal with the stress. It makes you more resilient. Um, and you have to stay positive and you have to always um, you know, maintain control of your emotions and, and just really lead uh, your team uh, in an appropriate way. I mean, these are stressful times and emotions can run high at times and, you know, we're all human. So you just have to do your best. You have to do what's right. You have to treat other people the way that they want to be treated. And you have to be committed to excellence. You know, we're stewards of the community's uh, precious resources. And, um, you know, we have to really do what's right for the community. So what's maybe been the toughest decision you've had to make in the last, I'm gonna say, what, six weeks or so? Well, the, the challenge right now is responding to the community's needs. Um, you know, when we sign up to be a city employee, part of the social compact is 
agreeing that you're going to be a disaster service worker in a time of crisis or emergency. And I think most of us thought in the back of our mind, you know, yeah, whenever the next big one comes, you know, there's going to be an earthquake and we'll, we'll rally. But nobody ever envisioned a global pandemic and people are scared and it's hard because, you know, our highest priority as library leaders is to look out for the health and safety of our staff. And, you know, our staff are on paid furlough right now if they're not doing essential work. But, you know, through the Department of Human Resources at the Emergency Operations Center in San Francisco, we've been having to activate waves of our library workers um, to serve in lots of different capacities. And our staff have been stepping up. They're staffing food pantries. They're preparing meals, distributing meals. Um, they're serving as contact tracers, which is a really good role for librarians because we're meticulous. We know how to log information and, um, you know, we're very skilled with asking questions and, and working with the public. So we're supporting the Department of Public Health and the UCSF hospital and doing this very important contact tracing work. And we're serving as site monitors at hotels. You know, I can go on and on about the myriad ways that our library personnel are supporting the city, our response to this uh, public health emergency. But it's been really hard to help our staff work through their feelings. It's, it's scary. Um, and so that, that's been challenging. I can only imagine. All right, um, a little bit more just about leadership is, what's the best piece of leadership advice that you've ever received? Well, um, you know, I mentioned at the outset, I was raised by my grandparents here, and, you know, I, I call him my old man, my grandfather, um, you know, he, he told me, you know, he's a retired first sergeant, he was, and he fought in two wars, and, and he instilled in me, never ask somebody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And he also taught me about integrity. He said, you know, your integrity is the one thing that nobody can ever take away from you, but you can give it away if you're not careful. So those stuck with me. And then the uh, Hall of Fame college football coach, Lou Holtz, he has influenced some of my thoughts about leadership. Um, you know, I'm dating myself, but I, I went through this leadership seminar in San Mateo County early on as a branch manager. And <laughs> the, the teacher had this VHS set of Lou Holtz's leadership advice. And he, he had some great lessons about teams. And he was talking about um, the difference between successful teams and unsuccessful teams. And successful teams can answer affirmatively to three questions. Uh, do you care about me? Um, can I trust you? And are you committed to excellence? And, you know, this guy has coached six different college football teams and by the second year, each time, he got his team to a bowl game, which is pretty extraordinary because he coached my alma mater, University of South Carolina, and we were winless, 0 and 11 his first year. And the second year, we won 10 games and beat Ohio State in our bowl game. That's a pretty incredible transformation. But through those, those three questions, you can extrapolate three things. Uh, you should always do your best. You should always do right, and you should always, he said the golden rule, but there's, there's a platinum rule now. You don't want to treat others the way you want to be treated. You want to treat others the way they want to be treated. So those are pretty basic values and leadership principles that I believe in, but um, I think they've been working pretty well for me. Mm, all right. And then just a little bit more about you know, advice that you want to give to the next generation of library leaders that are out there? 
You got to show up. You got to be present. You have to work hard. Um, you know, particularly in a leadership role, you have to give so much more than um, sometimes you think may be humanly possible. I mean, you're all in and, you know, I'm always on, you know, this is um, a seven day a week job and, you know, it's a, it's a different scale and different communities, but um, you just have to really lead by example and be willing to um, dedicate yourself in a way that um, it's, it's, it's mission driven work. And I, I know we're all mission driven in this profession, but you know, if you're going to be a senior manager or a library administrator, uh, there is another level of commitment that you will have to bring to this profession. It's interesting that you say that because, I mean, I know when I was working, I, unfortunately, who I was was defined by what I did, and I couldn't separate the two things. But I think in your particular case, it's real obvious. I mean, you're also a father and first, and... I mean, you, you talk about being so committed to the job and obviously you are, but you, you still figured out, you've made that balance and between you know, the home life and, and your work life. I mean, what's the secret, Michael? Um, you have to protect certain time. And you know, for me, um, I try to be there you know, all my son's football games on Friday nights and, you know, work out with him whenever I can. You know, during this pandemic, we've been jumping the fence at his high school, <laughs> um, getting out on the, the field and throwing the ball around. And, you know, you just, you have to make time uh, for what is important to you. Um, so it is a balance and it's hard because there's lots of important functions that I have to go to on the weekends. And, um, but you know, you just gotta do your best. You talked about some of the really amazing things that your staff at um, San Francisco are, are doing, but what are some things that you've seen in some other libraries in California that have impressed you during this, the pandemic? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, Jayanti Ottoman, she's on this webinar. I saw some incredible work she was doing with her staff to support the census. I believe she has her staff calling library patrons to encourage them to submit their census information uh, because there's so much at stake for our communities. Um, I also saw Sarah Jones up in Marin County uh, Marin County Free Library, they successfully launched emergency child care uh, for the healthcare workers in their county. So just phenomenal work. And I take my hat off to both of you. And I know there's other library directors. Uh, I know El Dorado County, I think, uh, they're still doing some level of curbside pickup. And uh, people are being very innovative uh, during this very challenging time. So I'm, I'm very inspired by our colleagues in the profession. And then with all of those things that you're doing in San Francisco, like, you know, working with the, uh, the public health department or with the hotels or the, uh, the contact tracing, did they come to you or did you go to them or how did these um, partnerships, I guess, get started? It's really being driven by the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. So San Francisco is fortunate because we have a dedicated department of emergency management. So a lot of the infrastructure to respond to an emergency was in place and we have continuity of operations plans. And so um, through this Emergency Operations Center, they have a policy group and they have, you know, different leaders in the city that are looking at the needs. And then all of our city departments on a weekly basis, we have to submit a list of our staff 
and what our staff are doing. And so San Francisco Public Library has a large workforce. We have about 900 employees. So when the city is trying to figure out how they're going to respond to all these needs, they look at who is available, who is sitting idle right now. And our staff have been stepping up. I mean, they're really heroes and heroines. They're doing incredible work, uh, physically demanding, um, just incredible work. And I, I couldn't be prouder of the San Francisco Public Library staff. Mm, you have every right to be that. Uh, okay, um, a little bit lighter kind of thing. What, what you been doing to pass the time in the past few weeks? So I've been jogging, I've been walking uh, in Palo Alto and, um, you know, doing some push-ups, just trying to stay active, watching a lot of movies, um, playing way too much online chess. I started playing online chess in 1999 uh, on Yahoo, and there's now a website, chess.com. So I've created my persona, Steve Caballero, again. He's a professional skateboarder. And I've been playing way too many games. I'm not even going to tell you all how many games I've been playing every day. But it's what I do when I get off work sometimes. It helps me unwind. Um, yeah, and I've been reading. I, um, I finished this book, The Essential History of Korea. Um, I'm reading an Eric Larson book now, uh, an ebook. Um, it's Isaac's Storm. I think that was his first book. Many people know Eric Larson from The Devil in the White City and a lot of his subsequent titles. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been uh, trying to stay busy. I'm I think I'm an introvert at heart, so I'm okay hunkering down. <laughs> you know, I got my son, I got my girlfriend, um, so I got my core group. Okay. I, I think maybe whenever the next CLA conference is, we should organize a chess tournament, okay? I would love that. All right. I would love to play beat you, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, one more question, but before I do, if there's any questions that you want to uh, ask Mike a woman, put it in the, uh, the chat box or in the q and I, I noticed a couple earlier, so I wrote those down, but if you have any other questions, put them in there now. But um, Last question for you, uh, Michael Lambert, your favorite book, movie, music, and food, go. Um, favorite book, I mentioned The Missing Piece by Shel Silverstein. Favorite movie, I love the X-Men series, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, favorite music lately, Club Quarantine on Instagram, uh, D-Nice, that's been great to listen to. Um, favorite food, I love Southern soul food, I love Mexican food, Korean food, German food. <laughs> what is Club Quarantine? Is that a band or? It's a Instagram channel. It's um, this 80s era DJ. He was paired up with KRS-One, a rapper. And now he's uh, kind of struck out on his own, D-Nice. And uh, he, he plays music. He DJs from his, his apartment in New York. And he just puts together some incredible jams and uh, old school rap, rhythm and blues. It's good stuff. I mean, like, how do you define old school rhythm and blues, for example? Maybe like, you know, some 70s and 80s. Oh, OK. Hmm. Well, maybe I need to get an Instagram account so I can uh, listen to that particular channel there. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were talking about food. You said southern soul food. I mean, that's like collard greens and cornbread and trip yeah. and grits. Or Biscuits or... and gravy, you know, pinto beans, anything cooked with some salted pork fat back in it to make it unhealthy. It's uh, so good. No, oh, man, don't say that. I haven't had lunch yet, so right. <laughs> it sounds good. But I have a, a few questions here that came in. First of all, what was a while ago, but said, do you still play Frisbee golf or 
Were you once upon a time a, a frisbee I golf player? I wish I had the time. Yeah, it's uh, disc golf. There's a great 18 hole course in Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco. But yeah, I played that for a long time. Um, when I moved to California in 2000, I got into it and played, you know, for probably about 15 years religiously. Um, but I just haven't had much time lately. But it's fun. It's like hiking, throwing a frisbee at a target. You know, you can pack a cooler. It's a great course down in Santa Cruz called De La Viega. Nice. Um, let's see, uh, with the um, evolving economic situation, how do things look for San Francisco public, like about hiring and vacancies and things like that? Well, I think San Francisco, we're so fortunate here because this community has invested heavily in their library system. So we have what's called locally a set aside and the real name for it is the library preservation fund. So the citizens here revolted in the early nineties and they did a petition drive and, and got a ballot measure on uh, the ballot and it passed overwhelmingly uh, over 70% affirmatively in 1994. So that established our funding stream and it's dedicated funding two and a half cents of every $100 in assessed property tax value in San Francisco, which adds up. That's about 40% um, of our $171 million budget. And then the other 60% is a baseline amount uh, from the general fund. So there's a formula and it um, goes up in good times and um, it, shelters us in some ways from bad times. Now, um, I have an incredible chief operating officer. Her name's Maureen Singleton, perhaps the finest CFO in the whole city and county of San Francisco. And we've been very good stewards starting uh, under Luis's leadership. So we've built up reserves. We've been able to self-fund our capital projects. Um, so with this downturn, we're, you know, we're not immune. Um, we're going to take a hit in the current fiscal year, and we're going to take a bigger hit next fiscal year, but we're going to be able to repurpose the money that we had otherwise allocated for some major renovations. Uh, we had a lot of capital projects in the pipeline that we'll be able to slow down. Uh, we're sitting on a lot of vacancies, over 90 vacancies right now. So the city has instituted a hiring freeze. So by stopping spending, stopping hiring, um, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to protect our workforce. And, um, you know, I'm still awaiting budget instructions from the mayor's budget office, but I'm cautiously optimistic in San Francisco Public Library's ability to weather the next two years. And then, so do you have any kind of staff furloughs right now or it it doesn't sound like you have anything planned for the future. Well, all of our staff are on paid furlough right now. Um, I expect that to continue as long as the city is locked down and a shelter in place. Our mayor, London Breed, has been providing incredible leadership and she's very compassionate, uh, providing this income security for our workers. My heart goes out to the temporary exempt as needed, our version of on-call uh, employees, because those employees are suffering. Um, unfortunately, they're not eligible for the paid furlough, and we're not able to give them hours uh, right now. Mm, yeah, I think it's pretty common. Uh, right now, it, have you started a, some kind of a process for uh, reopening the libraries yet, or is it a little bit too early in the game? It's very early. So um, I'm monitoring the effort by IMLS to do some testing of the virus with library materials. I don't know if you all saw that press release, but there's a lab in the Midwest that has the virus and they're going to test the virus on the surface of 20 different types of library materials, excuse me, that were provided by Columbus Metropolitan Library. And we've had some conversations with um, regional partners locally, Pacific Library Partnership, and some other consortiums, New York Metropolitan System, Rails in the Midwest, uh, the California State Library, they're 
um, leading an effort to think about reopening. And then my own leadership team, we've been um, thinking this through and, you know, having some preliminary conversations with labor. Okay, and then um, there's something that came up in the Q&A. Do, do you see the role of libraries in our communities changing because of the pandemic? And I think probably, you know, once we start to reopen, what do you think libraries are going to look like now? Different. Um, our institutions will endure, you know, San Francisco Public Library has been here since 1879, and that's not going to change. Um, you know, we've weathered wars, you know, earthquakes. So I have the full faith and confidence that the San Francisco Public Library and all of our institutions will continue. But we're going to have to be nimble. We're going to have to be flexible. You know, we're going to have to ha work with our staff to have them willing to uh, be flexible and take on other roles, be cross-trained. Um, you know, we're, it's going to be different and we're going to have less resources to work with, but we're still going to have to respond to community needs and those needs may change. Uh, we are part of the social infrastructure. We anchor our communities. And so we will be part of the recovery. Uh, I will give you an example. So city and county of San Francisco has established an economic recovery task force, and it's being led by our assessor recorder, Carmen Chu. And, um, you know, libraries were a big part of the economic recovery during the last Great Recession. And with our resources for workforce development, for small business, um, you know, we have some great resources, programs and services that we can bring online to support people that have been impacted, uh, who have been displaced from their jobs. Um, you know, and it'll be a, a matter of time before we can start allowing people back in our facilities because we are the largest free provider of high-speed internet in our communities. So I think that should be our top priority uh, is helping our communities recover. And then I think an equally important task is to support all of the school children that are impacted. Uh, there's, you know, learning loss that's happening. And so we need to help them uh, navigate this online learning environment and, you know, make sure we can have some services over the summer, even if it is virtual. All right, well, okay. Last thing, Michael Lambert, there's a webcam here, a webcam here, a webcam there. What do you want to say to library land? Stay strong, stay healthy, take good care of yourselves. You know, we're, we're all in this together. We're going to get through this. And we are going to come out on the other side stronger. You know, adversity will strengthen us. And uh, we are going to come out on the other side. And we will endure. And we will continue uh, anchoring our communities as anchor institutions. All right. Well, hey, thanks so much, Michael. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to do this. And I hope you're getting thinking about what trick you're going to pull uh, on your skateboard right now. <laughs> well, I'm in my office, so um, <laughs> I'm just going to keep it simple here. Let's see what I can do. How about that? Ooh. All right. <laughs> I believe that is called a 360, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I certainly didn't expect that, but <laughs> that's great. And hey, just a reminder too that, you know, do the evaluation for um, our interview today. I, I we'd appreciate that. Um, don't forget on Thursday, five o'clock, Derek Wolfgram is going to be our guest. And one thing we're going to talk to Derek about, and I was almost going to ask Michael about this, but uh, bit my tongue, but I was going to ask you, Michael, what would you have done if you didn't get the job in San Francisco? But that's what we're going to be talking to Derek about because there's been a few jobs that apparently he did not get that he thought maybe he was, you know, might have been the best person for, and he didn't get it. And so we're going to talk about that because I suspect there's other people out there that 
have maybe not gotten the job that they thought I'm the perfect person for. But, I mean, well, can answer that question? It, it would have depended on who got the job. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on who assumed the role of city librarian in San Francisco, some people value continuity, some people want to bring in their own team. So my first um, preference would have been to stay because I love this city and I love this institution. I love the staff that I work with, but it would have depended. Okay, well, I mean, we're going to hear what Derek has to say that about that on Thursday, and we're also going to have a virtual beer with him because we're going to be. You know, I'm jealous. You scheduled my session during lunchtime, and you're having virtual happy hour with Derek. I'm. I'm hey, so nothing jealous. stopped you from bringing in a little Southern soul food there. I make us all jealous. <laughs> so. But hey, Michael, thanks a lot. And yeah, it's been great. See y'all. We're later. going to get together sometime soon, and again, everyone out in Library Land, you take care, stay safe, and. Hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. Right on. Take it Bye. easy. Yeah. Hey, thanks again, Michael. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take care.